Hi, my name is Lorraine Dahlmeyer and I'm the director of Formula Botanica. We're the online accredited and award-winning organic cosmetic science school. And in this video series, we're interviewing inspirational skincare entrepreneurs all around the world to learn about their story and everything that they've learned along the way, because we want them to, to share their knowledge with you. So today I'm joined by Julie Longyear from Blissoma, who's going to be talking a little bit more about her and her business. So let me just toggle over so you can see her too. Hi, Julie. It's great to have you with us. Do you want to just tell us a little bit about you and give you give an introduction to you and your business? Sure. Uh, I am excited to be here, first of all. And um, I am definitely an entrepreneur by nature. Uh, I have always worked independently, at least in some capacity. And so my path has really taken me on this crazy up and down journey, you know, all, all through yes. many different evolution aspects of myself as well as business and I've just kind of like clung on to that wagon and held on and enjoying the ride and uh, so you know background wise I actually went to art school and then decided I might go into art restoration so then that led me into chemistry and that was kind of where my interest in natural health and everything collided with um, my creative aspects so do you want to tell us a bit about your business and where it started? Sure. Uh, so Blasoma is our naturally based uh, skincare line. We are a raw nutrition focused brand. So basically all the products use vitamins, nutrients, phyto compounds to support the skin, um, maybe provide things that are missing. Um, you know, so it's like taking a vitamin um, internally, and, but you're putting it on your skin instead and to really help provide the things that it needs to regenerate on a daily basis. And we, so the, the brand itself, we launched in 2006. The skincare line was launched in 2009. I had been doing aromatherapy and some body care stuff before that point. Um, Cause like I, I had more of a history in the creative arts and the chemistry aspect. And so the branding parts of it were a bit of a new process for me. So like that was what I came to more gradually. Um, and you know, just figuring out like, hey, selling skincare is not like selling a piece of artwork. Um, you have to, like the branding was a whole new element to me. So we went through a process of kind of learning hard knocks wise that way. And, um, but I still, I still enjoy the research the most and you know, really getting into the, the plants themselves. That's my favorite part. Um, I've definitely learned to enjoy the, the marketing and the branding work too though, because you know, it's about connecting with people, so. Absolutely, absolutely. And I know that many of our followers will really resonate with that story because they really connect with the plants and they really connect with the ingredients as well. But then obviously, as you say, you know, you have to turn it into a viable business with a real brand and and spend a lot of your time marketing as well. So, I know, or you can't make more stuff. I mean, that's the problem. If you, if you can't sell it, you can't make more. <laughs> exactly. It's so true. It's so true. So how many products do you sell at the moment? Oh, man. Um, it's probably like... 15 or so in the skincare line I'd have I had like it's been a minute since I've done a count it's not a huge range we try to actually make things um, as multi-purpose as possible so that people don't have to buy as many products and also so the line is a little more intelligible so you know it's not like you need you know five different products to make a regimen if you don't if you want it more simple you can have it a lot more simple so like your moisturizer can also be your eye cream that kind of thing um and the cleanser is also a makeup remover and you know for one of the recipes so it's it's about trying to make it as um accessible to people as possible for me because i really don't want people to get the impression that it's only something that's for a luxury consumer you know if they just want one or two products they can make something work so it's a pretty compact range um, but then we do still have some body care products so we have like a stress relief serum which is aromatherapy treatment we have some candles still so there's probably like you know 10 different aromatherapy scents of candles that we do in two sizes of tins um, we have a couple deodorants as well so a little bit of dabbling in other areas but the skincare line is still pretty compact Cool. So where do you mainly sell your products? Is it online? Do you uh, stock it through retailers? How do you get your products out into the world? We've been through a variety of different channels through our evolution process. We used to work with natural foods retailers, but we're not doing that anymore. Um, at the present, we have a few different channels that we distribute by. So we, we definitely do online work. Um, we have a website and we retail our products there, but it also acts as our wholesale 
portal. Um, and then we are wholesaling to spas and estheticians and really building a business with the holistic esthetician community, which has been really good to us. I really like working with them. They have the same kind of passion that we do for the ingredients and, you know, really client click. Uh, excuse me, client care. So, you know, interacting with the people, really providing the right products for their skin type, you know, making it more customized um, and really making sure that the products are making an impact. So that's, that's really important to me. And then also we distribute to um, about six different international locations and then those companies sell the products into their local market. So we're in South Korea, we're in oh, Taiwan, nice. we're in Singapore, we're in, Australia, the Netherlands, um, and we've been in Malaysia at one point. Um, yeah, so lots going on with all that. And, and I mean, it's great. All the different channels make us ro more robust in the sense that, like, it, it seems like it might be a lot to handle, and some days it is. Mm -hmm. But the nice thing is that all those channels have a kind of different flow to them, and so they fill in for one another. Um, so the diversity really helps us stay um, you know, like active and current and, you know, making sure there's cash flow coming in at various times of year. Cause I mean, sometimes there can be a dip in one market, but the other one's up. So that really makes us resilient as a business. And then we also do have a retail store here in St. Louis now. So we are selling products, um, you know, direct to the public through the store as well as representing other green beauty brands here. Wow, that's amazing. You have such a, a huge international footprint as well. That's really exciting. And, you know, it makes perfect sense. You don't want to put all your eggs in one basket, do you? You want to have lots of different options. Right. Yeah, that can get actually kind of dangerous to do that. Um, you yes. know, if you're, and one of the things I've learned, especially like with the wholesale market, um, it can get dicey when you're depending on somebody else to sell your products. And if they cut you, you know, when you're completely dependent on that, then that can really impact your your viability as a business or, you know, you might have to completely rebuild another way. So I really like having a little bit more control over our sales. Um, you know, I like having the direct relationship with the clients um, as well as the wholesalers. And, um, you know, I, I also like um, being in the different countries because they just have, you know, different needs. And it's been fascinating learning about what consumers in different places are interested in. Absolutely. That, that's amazing. So, I mean, how, many, how does your um, manufacturing process work at the moment? Do you have it in-house? Do you outsource it? What do you do? Yeah, we have it all in-house. Um, so one of the things that I was really committed to as we were building the brand was I really wanted to keep manufacturing in-house. Um, there really weren't, um, I was wanting something that was basically clean enough to be considered organic. Uh, when we were getting started and you know 10 years ago or so there was really not a lot of um, co-packers that were doing that and plus for me a lot of the joy comes from that really intimate connection with the ingredients um, I like handling them I want to be able to see the herbs and touch them and you know create different infusion strengths and textures and um, you know really get that up close and personal feel and plus it allows us to invite customers now into our production facility so that they can see the processes that we're engaging in which I think really creates a lot of trust um, because I think that the skincare world is one where trust has been broken a lot or like you know marketing is used to kind of like finagle you know oh hey like these things are in the product but it's such a small percentage that it's not really making a difference or you know they can literally come into our studio and see the ingredients that we're using in the products and know that like hey that extract that's sitting there with all the calendula flowers or the comfrey root in it that's going in my product so i know when i pick up this product that that is what's in there and you know nothing else we don't have uh, you know if we me and frank basically have been the people making everything now for years and so um if they trust us they trust what's in the products that's that well that, i totally understand where you're coming from because you want to maintain that connection but also it's quite hard to find to find a lab that you trust enough to outsource your formulations to, that they can source the right amount of ingredients, the right type of ingredients that meet all your specifications. So yes, this is something that our followers struggle with as well. So it's interesting to hear that you've yeah. kept it in house because that makes perfect sense. It um, does take cash to be able to do that. I mean, like it's been a slower growth process for us because we have to continually reinvest in space. So space has been a big issue for us. Whereas like if we were just using a co-packer and a warehouse, you know, we wouldn't necessarily need the amount of square footage that we do. So, you know, being able to receive pallets worth of bottles or, you know, 
large amounts of boxes at once, you know, 40,000 boxes coming in from the printer, you know, and then having space to store that as well as like work with the items and create pallets worth of, you know, like we, we've had to purchase and spend a lot of our capital on space resources and equipment and, you know, training people. So there's definitely been costs to it, but the benefits for us have made sense in my opinion. So how many of you are there in the company at the moment? So I have three employees and then there's a couple of freelancers that float around and, you know, also do things for us, but there's Frank, um, we have a staff esthetician and then a marketing assistant. So um, we're a compact team and everybody wears a lot of hats, uh, yeah. which is necessary at this point, but, and we want to get bigger obviously, but um, it's been good, you know, keeps the, the team flexible and, you know, having people that are multi-talented really helps to get more things done without having to um, have, you know, the confusion of that many different schedules and all of that. Absolutely. It's nice to remain nimble because, you know, the bigger you get, the harder it gets to actually get things done. Mm -hmm. So what do you feel are the main factors that have contributed to your growth? Hmm. Well, I would say just like persistence is one because there is so much competition out there and we did not start with a large marketing budget or a large budget period. So everything has been bootstrapped. And when you're doing things that way, you really have to just stick with it and keep working um, because it's person by person that we're converting people. Um, you know, we're not necessarily like hitting thousands of people at once with an advertisement or, you know, it's, we do a lot of having friends refer people um, and that can take time. So, you know, just being patient, sticking with it, you know, creating quality content, letting people know that we know what we're doing um, so that they can build that trust relationship. Um, our email list definitely is a major asset for us because people tend to really want that relationship with our brand. Um, we, we tend to find that when people find us, they've been searching for something for a while um, that, you know, and they may be like having a skin issue, like maybe acne or an eczema breakout or something like that. And they have been trying all kinds of products and, you know, maybe find us and usually we're the brand that they stick with when they, you know, find us, they don't leave because they get that answer that they're looking for in general. And, um, that, that tends to inspire people to like understand how the products are built in terms of their efficacy. So like for me, a lot of the thinking work that I do in designing a recipe goes into figuring out how to maximize the botanicals and how to deliver this, the precise ones in a formulation that are going to make a difference for specific skin issues. And that I think really pays off in the results. So that's a lot of times how people find us. Okay. Wow. That, you know, there's a lot packed in there. I mean, do you use social media as well? You talked about email marketing, obviously you talked about retaining customers. How does social media fit into your overall marketing strategy? We definitely do a good bit of social media. I used to do a lot more Facebook. Um, these days, Facebook is kind of less, you know, productive for us, partly because of the paid posts. Um, I still spend time on there, but it's more nice for, I think, professional networking for me. Um, mm -hmm. I've definitely really enjoyed some of the conversations I get to have with some esthetician groups and um, Green Beauty Insiders and you know people that are on there in specific groups where we're having conversations that are you know going over a period of time. Uh, those relationships have definitely been good for me. And then we also use Instagram, um, Twitter. I'm kind of like, mm, like sometimes I'm on, sometimes I'm off. I haven't really seen it be all that productive for us. So, um, it's like way more difficult for me to quantify, you know, how it's benefiting us. But Instagram, we're definitely working on heavily at this point. Um, our customers tend to really enjoy beautiful things. So a visual format is good for that. And, um, you know, just gradually kind of figuring out like what makes people tick on each platform because it's a little different. It is amazing the amount of strategy that can go into just just social media marketing. I mean, and that's not even including like a broader marketing strategy. Um, it takes a lot of thought just, you know, getting to learn the behaviors that will work on each one. Yeah, I know the feeling. We're, we're also heavily investing time in, in Instagram at the moment. And because, you know, as you say, people love beautiful things, but it does pay off. And I recognized a lot of what you said then. So mm -hmm. going back to the beginning, I mean, what do you wish that you'd known when you first started out? 
Well, if we go back to, you know, when I first started messing around with essential oils and blending those, I would say, A, I wish I had known how competitive the skincare and beauty world really is because it is tremendously competitive. And like sometimes the, the few times that I've hired someone to help with bits of PR work, you know, they'll say, okay, you know, list your competitors. And like the list is like, <laughs> you know, huge. And they're like, whoa, 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 that's enough. You, you can stop listing things now. And I'm like, well, I could keep going. Um, so there's definitely a lot of competition in the space. Um, but there's still a real need for products that are effective and, you know, meeting people's needs. Um, I don't think, like, I still think that there's a lot of room in terms of products that are actually really good quality because customers haven't necessarily connected with all that fully yet. Um, there's a lot of people that need to like kind of break out of their convenience routines and, you know, really learn about all the other amazing options that are out there. So I would, but I wish I had known how competitive it was because that would have prepared me a little bit better for like how long it might take to, you know, build a client base. Um, and then I also wish I had understood branding and marketing better because that's really the key to succeeding in the beauty world, in my opinion. Um, after all these years, I mean, the formulations are incredibly important, but um, nobody's going to try them if they don't like the way that they're marketed. So that's how you get them to try and see if they really like it. And um, I really didn't, I didn't have any background in marketing. I had a visual arts background, but I didn't have the communications and you know, like how, how to get people to take action on something. Um, so all that has been stuff I've learned on the way up and even just branding. Like I didn't necessarily, I was used to maybe just like putting a price sticker on a piece of pottery and selling it or, you know, like I sewed for people. So I did custom garments and selling that, you know, that process was very different from selling a, a branded consumer good. And I just didn't realize how different it was going to be. And that's just complete naivete. I, I, you know, I was, again, interested in the chemistry and wellness aspects of it more than I was interested in the packaging and the logo and things like that. So, but I, believe me, I gradually came around. Like, it didn't take that long. I, within about a year and a half of, like, you know, getting out there and, like, showing things to people and doing a few trade shows and things like that, I was like, yeah, I think we need to make some changes. Like, we're going to tweak this and come back at it. But I think some people get that knowledge from just industry experience. And I was pretty young when I decided to go out on my own. So there's a lot of stuff that, I mean, other people might have learned from working a job that I just happened to learn it while trying to do my own thing um so because i was i was like 20 25 26 you know so pretty young still yeah okay so in that case what advice would you have for someone who wants to follow in your footsteps uh i would say take your time getting started um you know Sometimes, like, you don't want the, the time that you take to be a roadblock because some people will, like, try and make things so perfect that it becomes an impediment to actually getting things done. Um, I don't mean that necessarily, but, you know, make sure your plan's solid because it can be incredibly expensive starting a business and you want to make sure that your money is placed well. You know, do your market research. Make sure that you know what your client is looking for. You know, spend the time, you know, test marketing on a small scale go ahead and work small if you need to for a while in order to get that feedback and, um, you know, make sure that the products are really impacting people the right way. Um, you know, take your time to develop your website and make sure it's the graphics are good because I mean, the graphics are so like, you got to hit it like right on the money, um, in order to hit the right consumer. And, you know, the people interpret your line differently. Like you might think that the graphics are beautiful, but if they're not, right for say like you're trying for the luxury space and you use the wrong colors or something you know like it's very specific out there so i recommend working with a graphic designer that's really good and knows the product space like don't pity that you know she does book covers um you know pick somebody that actually knows the cosmetic industry so that they know the context that your products are going to be placed in and and definitely take your time with labels and packaging development because that's going to be the number one thing that determines whether people try the product or not yeah 
that's great advice so basically take your time try not to be too much of a perfectionist which is something we see an awful lot of and spend a lot of time thinking about your brand and you know making sure that it's absolutely bang on the money which i think is fantastic advice so i think we'll leave it at that because you've just given us a wealth of information in you know 25 minutes so thank you so much it's been an absolute honor and privilege to to host this video with you and obviously this will go out to all of our followers who are obviously looking at your brand now thinking, oh, wow, I wish I had something like that. So I'm sure that you're inspiring a lot of people out there. So thank you very much for, for joining me for this video. Oh, you're so welcome. Thank you so much for having me. Cool. I'm just going to toggle back to me. Thank you very much for joining us on YouTube or, on, or if you're watching this anywhere other than on our blog, head on over to formulabotanica.com forward slash blog and you can see all the latest articles that we've got up there at the moment. We'll be back with more installments for the Meet the Skincare Entrepreneur series here on our YouTube channel and on our blog. So we hope you're enjoying them. Leave us a comment and let us know what your aspirations are of becoming a skincare entrepreneur. Thanks. Bye.